Parents' Blueprint for a Successful Wrestling Career Introduction Welcome wrestlers, parents, and coaches, I hope many of you find this book in the early stages of your current wrestling role and can take lessons outlined here and apply them where they can help you. This book is intended for wrestling parents that either have a lot of questions with no answers, or are given too many answers for only a few questions. In both instances, things are equally frustrating. Parents of younger wrestlers may wonder things like, should my child be lifting weights, should my child be losing weight, or how hard should I push them to reach their potential? As parents gain experience with each new season, they may find many trusted bits of advice from different experts within the sport that somewhat contradict each other. At the end of the day, the option which may be the best choice for your wrestlers is time-consuming at best, and stressful at worst. The best way to set a kid up for success varies, there are a lot of credible men and women who have a track record of making top-tier wrestlers. However, no method of training program has a 100% success rate. It's important to realize that the goal is long-term because too often parents and coaches alike ignite a hatred for the sport by pushing their young wrestlers too far. This book captures common advice, lays out possible outcomes, the risks, downfalls, as well as a few, extra tidbits of advice scattered throughout. In short, I will give a pros and cons list of the most common advice my parents and I have heard as we stumbled our way through a successful wrestling career ourselves. What this book is not intended to do is be an instruction manual to build a good wrestler. What I do offer here are options and the ability to make a more informed decision concerning the situations you and Apos, LL face because there will be possible long-term effects to consider. Often, parents tell their son or daughter to do something that produces immediate results without considering whether they are setting their kid up for long-term success or not. Too often, I witness some incredible athletes burn out and not even try to wrestle at the next stage of their scholastic careers. I wrote this book to redeem an array of national champions that never were and to grow our sport, from the bottom up. If you, the reader, feel like you have a thought that would be beneficial for our writing team there will be an email to forward any questions, comments, or attachments that you may come to mind. Just like our sport, we hope this novel can continue to grow and we are open to the idea of adding or omitting information that will help the overall quality. Chapter 1 Stress I do not know what the most dominant wrestling style is. I, myself, won a national title but I only won one. There are individuals with three or even four titles with styles and training methods completely different from one another. Kyle Dake, a four-time national champ, has a style considerably different from Kale Sanderson, another four-time national champ. I and Apos, am sure you could measure, statistically, who was the best wrestler of all time based on takedowns. You could do the same for wins and pins too. But does that mean that an Apos, s the best style or simply the best combination of strategy and abilities? For that matter, if we look at every national champ in the last 10 years, you'll notice that most of them are different from each other. Some shoot a really fast shot while others rely on upper body takedowns. Just like a chess match, there are near infinite possibilities of moves in any given match. How I've always explained the idea is that wrestling moves are like tools on a tool belt. A good coach passes their best tools to his wrestlers, and a good wrestler gathers all the tools they believe to be beneficial. Unfortunately, having a lot of tools on your tool belt doesn't make you a mechanic. Furthermore, it doesn't matter how well you can swing a hammer, if you don't know when or where you should be swinging it. And it does you little good to use a powerful electric angle grinder, on a job that only requires a little bit of sandpaper or a nail file. In the same manner, knowing a wrestling move so and so used to win an Olympic title, is not the same as recognizing when it can and should be used in a stressful situation. It is fairly easy to flow through a series of moves, drill the perfect shot, or imagine the perfect reaction, when you and Apos, re-strategizing with your buddies. It's a different story to recognize the opportunity at a given moment, which is why we practice each move, consistently and repetitively. I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. One of my favorite quotes from Bruce Lee explains that it's better to practice a move thoroughly, 
rather than practice a lot of moves occasionally. I completely agree with Bruce Lee. Practice, practice, practice. It's the cornerstone of any and every successful athlete. However, with that logic, everyone assumes the man who drills one kick 10,000 times has a good kick. I do not doubt the man who has acquired many hours doing the same move has flawless technique. However, I know several people who have spent a majority of their college careers practicing the same series of fundamentally sound moves but having little success implementing them competitively in less than optimal situations. Why is that? Or more to the point, why can anyone buy Dan Gables, Olympic gold medalist, how to wrestle DVD or VHS, drilling those moves repeatedly, still having yet to hit a single, solitary one of his moves in a match? Why does it take so long for one person to hit new moves, but not others? One of the most frustrating things as a coach or parent is knowing your wrestler was taught something that would help them during a tough match. What's even worse is when you get a chance to remind the wrestler of the said move during a break in the action and they still fail to put words into action. This could be because of several reasons and I would love to go right into it. The best way to begin is by starting with similar situations through the lenses of different facets of life. I'm sure everyone has had a moment during a school test where they realized they completely forgot material they thought to be memorized. My teacher used to say something to the effect of I guess you should study harder next time because if you know the material you shouldn't forget it when it counts. I find that to be a good analogy for wrestling. I don't believe there is any substitute for practice and experience. However, there were a few times that I thought I had done enough to have memorized everything needed for an especially important test. As it turned out I had forgotten significant portions when push came to shove. I'm sure some can relate or at least froze trying to speak in public or in front of a camera. I know I'm not the only one who's had their notes written up and practiced, but felt real silly stumbling over my words as my carefully laid plans fall apart. It becomes a lot more difficult in the moment under stress and it requires not just going through the motions but focused training to maintain composure and minimize undue stress. In wrestling, most people recognize a stressful situation as a competitive match where the stakes are winning or losing, advancing in the bracket, or dropping to the consolations. But it doesn't have to be. In practice, most coaches' primary method for inducing stress on their athletes is making them tired through conditioning. Without question, this is a time-tested method. Most doctors say if you exercise it will help improve your mood. The logic, therein, is that you can't be mad about something at work, if you're gasping for air. However, what happens when an individual pushes or is pushed past a comfortable level of exhaustion for extended periods? At a certain point, the physical strain begins to play a mental game, and those who push through gain a stronger, mental fortitude. This isn't anything new or groundbreaking. Since conditioning is the most common and widely accepted form of a stress inducer, this will be the focus of this next section. Generally speaking, conditioning is not a voluntary activity, especially with younger wrestlers. I say this because it is usually the coach and APOS's job to encourage the wrestler through the workout. I very rarely ever see the wrestler volunteer to enjoy an exceptionally difficult workout which is okay, normal even, but it has to be taken for what it is. Yes. Technically any individual can choose to walk away at a given time but that would mean failing to reach or exceed expectations which the individual feels are expected of them from their friends, family, girl or boyfriend, coaches, and parents, etc. These are a great deal of social scenarios that bring a great deal of social pressure. With the right's words, anyone can form a cult and get dozens of people to willingly drink poisonous Kool-Aid or they can start a wrestling team and make the most well-conditioned athletes their creator ever put on a mat. In either case, the individual is listening to and following expectations. Even if they chose to work out on their own to lose or gain weight, there is the implied expectation that to accomplish the goals, they or others said extra work is needed. I have yet to see a wrestler underweight run in trash bags nor have I seen a wrestler believe they were the strongest in their weight class and refocus their efforts elsewhere, like conditioning. In this sense they aren't voluntary participants, are they? Now one could argue over the expectations and pressures put on by coaches, teammates, friends, family, 
etc. are going to happen their entire life. I've heard the argument you won and Apos, T be able to prevent it from happening, however you can help grow the athlete into a stronger competitor by teaching them what it is they need for themselves, what they should or shouldn't and Apos, T be doing, then helping foster the courage to respectfully make the decision against the pressures and expectations of teammates and coaches. With that logic it would make more sense to help your wrestler become independent in their training and life choices. Yes, as an adult figure in their lives you should always be helping them to strive toward a successful independent career. They should have an ever-increasing part in their own training and things should be explained to them. Kids are curious creatures and often enough satisfying that curiosity is enough to buy into whatever you feel is best for them. As a general rule people are more invested into things that they helped create. However, depending on when your wrestler starts, they may be in at a very young age, as anyone with kids will tell you, there is a long time between when you teach a child and when that child will act upon that advice. An example for my personal life that is an internship I had in college to teach an elementary class in the Cleveland area. One week we spent the entire week going over the benefits of brushing your teeth. We had big teeth and toothbrushes, songs, and art and amp, crafts. The magic school bus was on TV. It was a great week and the kids without a doubt understood they needed to brush their teeth. The next week the same kids still didn't brush their teeth. So, each day we had to show them and walk them through it again, and again, and again. It wasn't really voluntary, the kids didn't want to do it, but it was for their benefit so we forced them to do it but it wasn't a punishment and in a lot of ways, especially with younger athletes, training for wrestling is the same way. There is an understanding, whether true or not, that they have to do the work if they are supposed to meet and or or succeed the standard they believe they are held to. It's important to make this distinction because I believe physical exhaustion isn't the most efficient way to induce stress, especially when it and APOS, is seen as a duty in the individual's mind. I have to lose more weight or I have to work harder sounds more like an obligation than I want to lose weight or I want to work harder. I would argue that mental stress is more efficient at being disruptive than physical stress. A great example of this is the process it takes to become a Navy SEAL. Every Navy SEAL has had to go through what is referred to as Hell Week. I, myself, have never gone through it, but it is to my understanding that the hardest part of the entire week isn't the four hours of sleep you're allowed for the week or the insane feats of physical exercise each recruit is put through. Nor is it the near-freezing waters one is expected endure. From the mouth of David Goggins himself, the hardest part of the entire ordeal is the mind games the drill sergeants play the entire time. Staying up for three plus days in a row isn't what gets people it's staying up for three plus days and your drill instructor reminds you of a few things like, at any time, you can ring a bell, put down your helmet, and walk away to a comfortable cot, a warm meal, and a hot shower with no repercussions. There are a lot of people who can be forced to lay in the surf when the water is 40 degrees but how many people will do it willingly? For wrestling, Mental stress could be a wrestle-off for the starting spot or a reward or punishment for a defined challenge. Some wrestlers cut excessive amounts of weight which induces mental stress of self-control because food is everywhere. What the stress is doesn't matter. What does matter is that the individual becomes personally invested in reducing or continuing the stress through their efforts and learning how to control and manage this stress when it comes. When consequences of doing well are comparable to the consequences of doing poorly, then the true mental fortitude is tested. In my opinion, the most efficient way to create mental fortitude is to make failure as equally tempting as a success so the wrestler has the option to choose between being comfortable or remaining in a state of discomfort. Yes, an authoritative figure such as a parent or coach can pressure an individual to push their physical limits. This method can work for most people. The army does this to mold men and women who've never worked out a day in their lives, successfully turning them, respectively, into soldiers. It will most likely work on your wrestler as well. However, the downside to this is that pressure has to remain constant to be effective consistently. For example, 
I am confident that most people who've attended college have seen a student who had great promise of success either academically or athletically but underachieved horribly as soon as their compulsory support system was unable to encourage them. To give a more specific example, let's examine the wealthy kid incapable of living up to family expectations while on their own because they never had to choose successful pathways. Most likely, the kid was only given positive options up to a certain point. If forcing a kid to attend a smart school doesn't automatically make them smart, or imposing success on a kid doesn't automatically make them successful, then why would imposing a hard workout automatically make a wrestler tough? I mention this because it makes a nice segue into why the next chapter is important. Chapter 2 Fear I would argue that there are three reasons a wrestler can do everything right in practice but not a match. However, I will only talk about two extensively. The third reason, in my opinion, is the least disruptive and that is a fear of injury. It's the least disruptive because most people don't have it for starters. This one is generally present in individuals who have had severe injuries especially after a lengthy history of recovery and setbacks from said injury. Individuals like this are less ready to fully commit. Who can blame them? I'm sure it is very difficult to push your physical limits when the last time ended in a devastating injury. However, the reason I don't count it is that, in my opinion, a fear of injury is important to have and it is not preventing anyone from being good rather it is preventing another injury. It is the job of the individual to earn their body's trust again through a progression system. The worst thing a coach can do with an injured player is force them to choose between making the coach happy following instructions and avoiding injury. No matter what happens now that relationship is damaged because either the athlete disregarded something the coach wanted of them or they did it and the entire time thought about how the coach is making them do something they might hurt themselves doing. There are times when a wrestler may have to choose to push through an injury for the sake of a competition or a goal but generally speaking, this is a conscious choice where the pros and cons are weighed, forgotten, or ignored and action is taken. I've seen many student athletes push through broken bones, torn tendons, and separated muscles. However, I've never seen a single one of them afraid of what the possible consequences could be. For whatever reason, they accepted their fate and the consequences at that moment. The fear of injury is important because it's what helps the average person from getting hurt. If an individual chooses to accelerate the recovery stage, they are riding a fine line between injury and recovery and that should be their decision as they will live with the consequences not the coach, teammates, parents or guardians, etc. Now I'm not talking about the kid who says he can't practice because he jammed his thumb or rolled his ankle last week. We all know the kids who will milk an injury for all it's worth and we all know the kids who will tear a bicep in practice because they didn't want to do sit out for rehab. As a coach, parent, guardian, or whoever if you feel your wrestler is not yet ready to do something, then that is your observation as the wrestler's protector and you should act on it to whatever degree you see fit but understand it is your responsibility to keep your wrestler and team healthy. Regardless, the fear of injuries can be summarized as the fear of pain and I categorize it in the same group as the second distress, that is the fear of getting tired which ultimately is a fear of physical discomfort or in other words a milder form of pain. Injuries may be a more severe form of pain and appropriately takes a high level of priority to avoid but in the end, it is still only a physical discomfort that most individuals don't consider in the heat of the moment. Some of you may already be questioning why isn't the fear of blowing a shoulder out ranked higher than the fear of being completely exhausted? Considering getting hurt is considerably more painful than the physical demand of being tired that is a fair question. And you'd be right, a torn MCA hurts a lot more than running for however long you choose. My counter-argument is while an injury is more extreme, being tired is more common. When one gets hurt, they stop, the pain is treated, and efforts are made at every stage of recovery to avoid the pain. Also, many young wrestlers fail to recognize they aren't invincible so many of them never consider what happens if they get hurt however, blowing your gas tank first period, becoming exhausted in the first period, doesn't excuse you from the second or third period. Additionally, every single wrestler has been gasping for air midway through a workout. In these moments, the consequences of getting tired generally are the opportunity to get even more tired. 
To most people getting tired is more relatable and by extension scarier experience than getting hurt. With that being said the fear of getting tired is the easiest on my list of fears to address. I believe a prominent example of addressing the fear of getting tired is University of Iowa's wrestling program. Where a seemingly foundational aspect of their wrestling program is developing young men and women who never seem to slow down or stop. Training minimizes this fear but our sport is unique in the sense that wrestlers need both anaerobic, explosive, sprint-like muscles, and aerobic, endurance, long-distance muscle, capabilities. What that means is hypothetically any body type can find an exceptional winning strategy. To be a great swimmer there is an ideal body type, the best swimmers are very tall, often with unusually long torsos and arms. They have large feet and flexible ankles great for kicking propulsion. This is a common understanding of the sport of swimming. However, wrestlers don't have a well-defined ideal body type like that. Some muscle groups benefit our sport more commonly than others. For example, Ohio State wrestling coach Dustin Myers believes the most important muscle group for wrestling is the posterior chain. However, strong legs and back muscles don't directly translate to a better wrestler. Different body types produce different wrestling styles. This might mean a well-defined muscular body overpowers an opponent. Or it might mean a well-conditioned body outperforms an opponent. Whatever the body type, each wrestler will become more exhausted faster the more they have to rely on the areas of their weaknesses. Similar to how a bodybuilder may be stronger but loses endurance. And a cross-country runner overexerts himself if he picks up powerlifting. In wrestling, if there was a single position that could act as the litmus test for all body types it would be shooting a shot like a single leg only to get sprawled on. It requires both strength and conditioning, the flexibility of the shoulders. There's timing to not only take the shot but as you progress through the attack there's moments of sudden explosion. In between those explosions are periods of constant exertion. All while maintaining footwork to stay in a good position. Now we will use a shot to outline our final fear, the fear of failure. In this section, I'm focusing on those who don't shoot because they are afraid of getting tired trying to finish the shot. Some of you may be thinking I'm not afraid of losing I just don't want to get into bad positioning. Maybe you have bad experiences getting extended or it just sucks to get your face pushed into the ground. I still argue this falls into the fear of failure. To make things smoother I'll replace failure with loss but a proven psychology fact is people will avoid loss more than they will seek gain. By that I mean the more experience a person become the less often they take a shot that leads suddenly and directly to their face. So, when they shoot a shot that leads to them getting overextended and unable to do anything it happened in a systematic way. So, what happens is they are afraid of losing what they've gained that they hold on longer than they should. There isn't really any reason to hold onto a leg until you get your arms over your head. If you're in a situation that it's guaranteed you're giving up the takedown, then why waste the energy fighting it? There are plenty of finishes and escapes up to a certain point on a shot and there are without a doubt times you cannot shoot because a shot is not there. However, what I always found interesting is how small of a window that is in the last 30 seconds of the last period when the fear of taking a bad shot is reframed into A I'm going to lose. In my mind there is a difference between simply understanding a shot isn't an option now and not knowing if the shot is there to take. Not shooting because it's not there is smart. Not shooting because you're not sure if you're in good enough position is not wanting to lose what you worked so hard gaining by gambling on a move you're not sure about. This shows where you are comfortable and where you are not and I still see that a fear of failure just in the sense of losing position not the match. This fear may be consistent through every match. It may be just a third period dilemma. It may even just show up when your wrestler is up or down in points. Whatever case, the individual doesn't trust their ability to continue to push through the exhaustion which is why I stress the willing versus forced mental stresses. From my experiences, I've noticed the harder someone pushes themselves the more often they'll push the pace with their offense. That's not to say these wrestlers are exceptionally good. I've met an unnamed gentleman who was quite unlucky when it came to winning matches but he would also shoot 10 to 15 shots each period. 
He was the same one who would astound the team with insane amounts of effort. In my experience, I have seen what seems to be a direct correlation between how far someone will willingly push themselves and their willingness to shoot when tired. Now that doesn't inherently mean those with compulsory support systems are at a disadvantage. For one there are plenty of exceptions to my understanding, especially at the college level. My roommate in college was one who was forced through his childhood career as a wrestler and he never failed to take a shot when given the chance. However, that is not the norm. I don't have any facts or stats to back my words but I've seen many times more wrestlers with compulsory support systems give up as soon as they were given the option especially as a younger wrestler. Also, the fear of getting tired isn't the greatest fear nor the most disruptive fear one can have. My experience has taught me that the fear of failure is. When a wrestler is given the option of feeling tired or feeling like they failed they will more actively avoid the fear of failure. This may look like shooting bad shots in the final seconds of a match in an attempt to snatch a victory as time expires. But they also avoided overexerting themselves to conserve energy before that sudden fury of attacks. Lastly, sometimes this saves the individual from wasting efforts and allows them to be more selective with their efforts and energy. Going back to my nameless gentleman from before. He may have taken 10 shots each period but come the third period or overtime those shots weren't the best. On the contrary, his opponents often had considerably more energy to burn which allowed them to finesse situations more often. I'm not saying don't shoot and you won't get tired. Just be more conservative on the shots you choose, you only have so many shots you can take, chose your opportunities wisely. Quality over quantity. After all, in the sport of wrestling, Conditioning is king above any other single attribute. As an example, there aren't a lot of people in this world who can say they are confident they can Jordan Burroughs, Olympic gold medalist, in his prime but there are some. However, if the situation is you come fully rested while Jordan Burroughs comes off from exhausting workout, I'm sure the list of people who could beat him would increase not decrease. Nothing changed besides how tired the Olympian is and that will make a bigger difference than being stronger than him, faster, better balanced, or whatever single attribute you want to choose, assuming your technique is comparable. Every match is affected the entire time by your conditioning, steps get heavier, hand fighting might get a little careless, attacks become less frequent. High value characteristics such as grit and drive may be the difference in important moments but conditioning sets the pace and stage for these important moments to happen. Would your opponent be out of position or better able to fight off a shot if he wasn't tired? Would the score be the same if you had more or less energy earlier on? What about if your opponent had more or less? As a high intensity contact sport wrestlers pride themselves to push themselves to the limits. That doesn't mean Jordan Burroughs or anyone else can push themselves indefinitely, they have to pace themselves. When, not if, but when your wrestler gets tired and is about to break, they will fall back to what they relied on in training. If they held the responsibility of continuing their suffering in the practice room, then they will hold themselves accountable to that standard on the mat. If they forfeited that responsibility to others, then they will continue to need the support to perform at the same level. Assuming the proper motivation can be implemented neither method outperforms the other in a significant way. But your wrestler may not be concerned with their conditioning. Maybe they are fairly confident in their training but still fail to take shots when it counts. I'm not with your athlete's coach and without knowing a single thing about your wrestler I would guess he's afraid to fail. Fear of failing is a double-edged sword. Everyone has it and it's why people struggle to talk to the opposite sex or public speaking. It's also the same reason some of the top tier wrestlers push themselves to almost inhuman conditions they are afraid of losing so much that the physical punishment they choose to endure pales in comparison to the thought of feeling inferior. Wrestling is one of the few sports that offer one-on-one -on -one contests of overall ability and as such offer a unique but personal relationship with loss. Most sports losses are followed by the words we would have won if my team, my teammate, my coach, etc. would have done this one thing better. It's hardly ever the individual and Apos's fault in their mind. Drop a catch? Well, the quarterback should have thrown it better or known I wasn't open. The quarterback gets sacked? Well, 
the line should have blocked better. In most situations and for most people there is always an excuse however big or small. However, wrestling offers no such luxuries. I know I can win because I know I am better, stronger, more conditioned, etc. may be a phrase on the tip of many wrestlers' tongues. Conversely, to admit a fair loss is to admit weakness or inferiority in some capacity to your opponent's ability. I remember being at a wrestling banquet some years ago and the host was making a point about wrestling and asked the audience to raise their hand if they hated losing more than liking to win or vice versa. Without exception, everyone raised their hand acknowledging they disliked losing more than they enjoying winning. People hate the feeling of being inadequate especially in contests of individual skill. For this reason, fear of losing is in my opinion more obstructive and harder to shake than the other two fears previously mentioned. So how does one shake the fear of losing? Well in my experience the fear of losing a match doesn't suddenly appear at any point during a match like being afraid to get more tired. It's prevalent throughout the match but its obstruction can vary throughout a match but never disappears. Generally, it comes after a slow build-up of anxiety of the course of a couple days before the actual match. As the day approaches so does the eerie feeling of dread. Have you ever had a butterfly in your stomach, which turned into nervous energy, which led to uncharacteristic wrestling such as a lack of offense and or, or getting tired faster than normal, all of which may have contributed to a loss? Is there any point in the match you can point to and think yeah, I was for sure afraid of losing there, that's the moment it sunk in and that's why I froze up and lost? Or is it a consistent feeling of you should have done better, you should have done this, you should have done that, you don't know why you didn't do this? Fear of failure is a constant feeling when it occurs. But the question is still the same, how can it be circumvented? To my knowledge, there are three ways to circumvent the fear of losing. The first is the least helpful and a problem in itself. That is becoming apathetic to the sport. I'm sure we've all seen the wrestler who is only in the sport because outside factors prevent him from quitting. Sometimes this individual is particularly good at the sport but is indifferent to their success for whatever reason. In college, it may be because of a much needed scholarship that they continue to wrestle. In high school, it might be all their friends wrestle and the coach expect them to come. In youth, it may be a parent compelling them. For whatever reason, they don't quit but at no point do they want to continue. This is different from when a wrestler loses a match and decides at that moment, they never want to wrestle again only to be at practice next week training to beat the kid that beat them. I admit in my youth I was notorious for this. I'd say I quit, I and Apos, am done, I'm never wrestling again this is stupid or something to that effect. Apathy can be a knee-jerk reaction to failure which is well documented in psychology but generally, is the result of caring too much and getting hurt for it. Time soothes wounded pride and the wrestler comes back recommitted to their goals, usually. However, general apathy is considerably more permanent and consistent. It's present after big losses and it and apos, s present after hard-earned wins. If a wrestler was married to the sport of wrestling this would be the point in the marriage right before a divorce. With that being said this marriage can be saved just like a real one. However, the way to save it is not to add more stress, stress being defined as the activities outlined in previous chapters. The most likely way to get an apathetic wrestler to be reinvested in the sport is to bring back the passion that may have originally hooked them once before. The longer the wrestler has been apathetic the harder it is to make them passionate again. No matter what the situation this is the worst way to overcome the fear of failure. Often, it brings what I refer to as an employee mindset where the goal is doing the minimum amount needed to keep the boss happy. The boss being their coach, parent, or whatever authority figure they answer to. When given the chance an apathetic wrestler will quit. I've seen two, three, and four-time state champs from across the country never even attempt to make weight in college. Their worst hours of the day were at practice and the farther from the sport they got the happier they were. In my experience, parents have the most difficulty accepting apathy so they strive to push their wrestler harder, which only makes them careless. Depending on the parent's goal and your kid this may be okay. In college, I've coached students whose parents, through extrinsic pressure, 
keep their son in the sport of wrestling because they know this individual's chances of successfully navigating college are increased with the academic support he has received and continues to receive while on the wrestling team. Their goal isn't making their son love wrestling, be great at the sport, or even continue to wrestle. It's to get him to graduate college and collegiate wrestling happens to be the most likely vehicle to reach that goal. But before everyone takes those last few sentences and runs with it using it as an excuse to push their wrestler through the ringer let and apos, a step back to the employee mindset. I'm sure most people have had a job such as a fast food cashier or something of the sort where outside of financial obligations you couldn't care less if you were fired at any given moment and it would almost be a welcomed relief because you did not want to work there. In these moments how would your boss giving you more responsibilities, yelling at you, having you work more hours, driving you to a different store to work harder, or otherwise forcing unwelcomed changes have affected your views of the job? More than likely it would only cement the fantasy of being fired or quitting. Once someone doesn't want to wrestle the only way to fix that is to make wrestling enjoyable. There are not many instances where, as the author, I'll try to tell my readers what to do but if you unintentionally make wrestling a punishment most people will avoid punishments when given the chance. It is inevitable that as a student continues to progress in their wrestling career it will become more taxing and chore like as more work is required to remain an active competitor and not many people enjoy losing so it's kind of a catch-22. To enjoy the sport, a young athlete needs to win occasionally. To continue to win as they get older more work is needed which makes the sport less enjoyable. Every sport has barriers to progress and those who don't value the sport enough to surpass these barriers get left behind. An example in wrestling might be weight management, whatever that means to you. Or in football, it might be two a days. Whatever the case, try to keep things enjoyable in some way for as long as possible. Now everyone is different. Someone may enjoy winning enough that making them better through extra training is enough, but that is an underwhelming minority, in my opinion. Maybe your wrestler needs to find or be given something they can enjoy and practice which could be as simple as wrestling games like King of the Mat, probably not. It could be they are in a room full of hammers, they get their butt handed to them every practice, and they just need someone they can beat up on to boost their confidence. Or they could even benefit from a break over the summer to reset. It might be something like being able to enjoy their childhood like a typical child would instead of training. Whatever they need it's up to their support system to identify their needs and to meet them but the fear of losing should be the least of their worries at this point. Generally speaking, it should be the goal of the support system to make an independent athlete by educating on their training but keeping things fun is easier from a supportive role. You know your athlete and I hope they trust if you introduce a weird exercise or something just to shake things up. There are a lot of books and resources to learn from but how many will treat your younger athlete like a socially unsure kid who has a few years of growing to do. The second way to mitigate the fear of losing is ensuring success which sounds like a no-brainer. Everyone naturally does this through their training. It can be described interchangeably with confidence or goals. Whatever you want to call it it's a great way to becoming a better wrestler. This is a great plan, almost foolproof until it is not. There will be times your wrestler is overly confident in their chances of success. Maybe that's because they beat their opponent already, maybe it's because they learned a new move, or they just ate their Scooby snacks after weigh-ins and feel great. There is a plethora of reasons as to why a wrestler is confident in his victory and when they are confident it is unwavering up until a certain point. The problem comes when their expectations are broken, goals are not met, or challenges are insurmountable. Going off of the fear of getting tired discussed earlier what happens when a wrestler is confident, they'll win because they are in better shape and when push comes to shove, they feel more tired than their opponent looks. This is a slippery slope that can go a lot of ways but rarely does it ever go well in the wrestler's mind. It's not uncommon for this to be a recipe for a premature breaking point. An individual can train to overcome this obstacle and their breaking point can be raised to an amazing level. Every level of a wrestler can benefit from gaining confidence in their ability. However, every wrestler is only human and eventually, anyone will break, it just takes the right conditions. 
Just remember that when you or your wrestler work towards reducing fears on the mat, it is equally as important to be prepared for the moment if or when they break. The last way to get over the fear of losing is through exposure therapy or simply put, exposing your wrestlers to insurmountable obstacles and or or losses. There are many bars, obstacles, and challenges a coach or parent can put in in the way of a wrestler. One couldn't count all the different workouts a coach can muster into a single afternoon or the number of tough tournaments to go to. Before we begin to break down different kinds of obstacles it's important to know what the intended purpose of setting an unachievable bar is. Like a therapist exposing an individual to their fear exposure will help reduce the anxiety of the fear. Losing may be a scary thought for young wrestlers then exposing them to defeats in the practice room will normalize the outcome of a match for better or for worse. After the emotional knee-jerk reaction against losing is dealt with then you can start to learn how to utilize a loss by learning from it. It's much harder to have logic and remain unbiased if your emotions are still wrapped up in the loss. After some control over a fear of losing is established that much more effort can be made into giving their best effort. The idea hopefully that the wrestler focuses more on giving their 100% than focusing on a need to not lose. Have you ever seen the semi-slide? It's probably the most extreme example of wrestlers avoiding losses. The semi-slide refers to when a wrestler makes it to the semi-final round of a tournament without losing a single match. Unfortunately, the wrestler suffers a loss and then begins dropping in every placement round until they have to wrestle for 7th and amp, 8th. Then more often in outstanding fashion, outcompete their opponent to prove they didn't belong in 7th and amp, 8th place. They were so sure they would get to the finals that anything less is not worth the effort. In this instance, it's to the wrestler's downfall that he didn't think he could lose as it made the humble pie too bitter for his taste. He did worse than what he might have had he expected to lose. Had he acknowledged he might lose he would have almost certainly have gotten third or fourth place. However, that defeated feeling after a hard-fought match was a blow to his confidence, they aren't ready for and they drop in a placement to seventh. It's important to note this is not training a wrestler to expect to lose. Nor is it bombarding a wrestler with defeat after defeat until he's discouraged from continuing any further. It's more setting expectations of success not on the outcomes of the match but rather expectations of how well they perform. Here are a few examples I've heard over the years, trying to get as tired as you can as early as possible, executing the things they work on at the practice in a live situation, staying in a position like top for amount of time, so many attacks with your left hand, stop so many shots. The list goes on and on but no matter what the objective it's instead of trying to score more points for a winner win is defined as whether or not they were able beat the challenge. There is a fine line between too much challenge and not enough and that will change from wrestler to wrestler. Your specific wrestler has different strengths and weaknesses than their partner or their opponent. I am going to move forward with the hope you already know what you can do as a coach or parental figure to give your wrestler a constructive loss of some kind. I am assuming you are aware of your wrestler's abilities and finding things he or she can't do isn't the problem knowing what is a good level of an ego check. As long as you have a general idea of what your wrestler is capable of assessing if a workout pushed your wrestler to be better or kept your wrestler from getting worse will be an easy distinction. The different kinds of impossible challenges to combat the fear of losing as I see them, peer, personal, and adult-led. The most effective in push or inhibiting your wrestlers to improve are challenges involving peers. Friends can make or break a great athlete. Iron sharpens iron is an old adage for good reason it describes the relationship a good partner has on the individual. The longer someone is in the sport of wrestling the more often they'll see a stud of a wrestler who goes to all the wrestling camps, does everything he's supposed to do, and has success on the mat. However, have you ever had the thought that his little brother is better pound for pound than the older brother? This isn't always the case but it and Apos, s frequent enough to take notice. I like to believe that it's because little brother is always getting beat up on by older brother, especially if they and Apos, re around the same size. In other words, he has to taste defeat and is forced to learn from it any time his brother wants to wrestle. Since it and Apos, S his brother, 
little brother is driven to surpass this challenge and continues to improve faster than his older brother. No matter the situation we learn more from a loss than we do a win. It's not hard to understand why the little brother is often better. With this logic I've always explained being the best one in the room is a curse more than it is a blessing but everyone wants to be the best which seems counterintuitive. Without anyone to push the pace making progress is harder. Without a doubt, skilled peers can motivate a wrestler to join their ranks or discourage a wrestle from continuing their efforts. How one would make a distinction between two is a practiced skill that becomes easier to notice when it happens. Personal challenges are simply goals that the individuals make in their minds with the hope of achieving. They can be simple and or or they can be grand wishes. Wanting to be a national champ can be considered along the same vein as wanting to run a 4.20 in the 40-yard dash. Generally speaking, personal challenges are outcomes the individual is invested in. Now here is the downside to a personal obstacle to overcome. If you are motivated to train to be a national champ that right there is the problem. Unfortunately, motivation is an emotion. I feel motivated today. I was motivated so I did extra work. It's good to have motivation but like any other emotion, it comes and goes. When it comes to facing impossible tasks, personal motivation is good to have but risky to solely rely on for that very reason. The task is impossible by definition so it will continue to push the individual regardless of what kind of mood they're in. Adult-led is a standard in the practice room as what would any practice be without a coach running it, calling out drills, and setting the expectations for the room. However, coaches and adults can't rely heavily on impossibilities because eventually, their players will stop trying to complete the challenges assuming whatever coach has in store is impossible anyway and eventually, that mindset will spill over into activities that should be possible. The best example I can think of that most people can visualize is when their coach would say one more sprint, one more set, one more whatever but continues to say that for several more after that. Eventually, the athletes stop believing it's the last one and they stop giving 100% on the last one instead of focusing on pacing themselves for the undefined amount that is to come. Pushing the team to beat the best runner in the room only works so many times before the majority of people accept their place despite what the coach may say. Chapter 3 Wrestling Stages The rest of this book is split into three parts, crawl, walk, and run. Each part represents what I consider the three stages in a wrestler's career. Crawl can be considered a person's first introduction to the sport of wrestling. This is when the young wrestler is focused on just learning moves and position. This is not limited by age but rather by experience. A 25-year-old male new to MMA and trying to learn a double leg is fundamentally on the same level as a 6-year-old going to their first wrestling practice. Everyone grows at different speeds and there is a wide variety of factors that determine how fast someone gets better. No matter the case, A wrestler in the crawling stage gets joy from our sport by noticing their improvement. They expect to lose and take their lumps in stride. Every practice they continue to search for chances to improve. As they begin to internalize moves and counters, they shift into the walking stage. This is when the young wrestler focuses on a string of moves and a series of counters. At this stage, Fewer and fewer moves become completely novel and slowly transition into new techniques becoming reminders or sparking untested realizations. At this stage, a wrestler knows how to hit moves in a drill and begins forming their style and move sets. In the world of martial arts, this is the same as a low purple or high blue belt. For those who don't know the belt system of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, It's the point of learning chess where you know how to move all the pieces and you start to see the intricate strategy that makes the game challenging and thought-provoking. A common sign of wrestlers learning to walk is when the pupil asks what happens if I hit this move? But what will you do if I counter with this? But if I do this? The more knowledgeable the question the further along they are in the stage. Lastly, is the stage where the young athlete feels confident modifying the technique to suit the situation or modifying the situation to fit the technique, the running stage. We all know any move practiced in the room rarely goes as effortlessly in a live match. There will be times your wrestler has to hit moves in a sequence or position they rarely, if ever, 
practice such as when a move doesn't work and they have to improvise what to do next. In this stage the sport becomes thoughtless, the moves become reactions. The same way you'd catch a ball your friend threw at you unexpectedly versus blocking or dodging. In the running stage, the move is no longer as important as position. To maintain better positioning, the young wrestler has to modify his technique to compensate in real time to his opponent's efforts. Each one of these stages is unique and should be treated as such. However, I think it's important before diving into the stages to note that you never leave a stage entirely only gain access to the next stage, which is why I named them crawl, walk, run. Everyone starts out crawling. With enough practice, everyone begins to walk but that doesn't mean they don't crawl occasionally. After enough practice walking, running becomes an option. As a runner, there are very few times you'll crawl but you can if the right situation pops up. Instead, you'll walk most of the time but can always run when need be. For convinces I am going to use a male, youth wrestler in fifth grade as my set example wrestler and he'll get older with each stage. No stage is limited to gender or age. Everyone has to start somewhere and without exception everyone's first year is spent learning moves and counters. One never really stops learning new moves. I'm over two decades into practicing the sport and I'm still learning techniques. There has been a recent surge of martial arts moves being introduced into the sport of wrestling as MMA has become more popular. You can see top-tier wrestlers at every stage experimenting with textbook Brazilian jiu-jitsu takedowns and reversals. The moment you start thinking you know everything that's when you stop improving as the world advances around you. However, no matter how many moves one memorizes it does not determine any wrestler's progression on the scale of crawl to walk to run. There is no checklist to determine if your child graduates to the next stage. Moves are always being rediscovered and by the end of a lengthy wrestling career, you will have forgotten more moves than you know at any given moment. Also, your wrestler could never learn a single shot and make his way to the running stage with upper body takedowns. That just means they excel at upper body wrestling but struggle elsewhere. It's possible that different positions or moves are at different stages of wrestling. No one says you have to be a perfectly well-rounded wrestler. It's natural to have focused talents in certain positions of our sport. Your young wrestler may have figured out to ride on top and as such he's asking difficult questions of what is possible from his favorite turn. This same wrestler can have no idea what to do on his feet or vice versa. That is fine and perfectly normal. Chapter 4, Crawl. I understand the desire to search the internet studying YouTube videos or Facebook clips trying to figure out how to wrestle. Unfortunately, learning a wrestling move isn't like memorizing flashcards. The best way to describe it would be like learning to drive a stick shift car. No matter how many times someone explains how to drive with a stick shift it is just something you have to practice to get a good feel on it. You could read every manual, watch a world-famous race car driver explain how to get out of first gear, and you can go through the motions but it doesn't mean anything until there is something at risk, like a fender bender. The same could be said about wrestling. Your wrestler might be able to explain in detail what a move is. It's not uncommon to be able to show the move in a choreographed setup shot or attack finish. However, that doesn't mean they have learned the move. A wrestler in the crawling stage will expect to lose occasionally if not frequently. They might be uncomfortable being in the room as they feel it's obvious, they don't know what they're doing and are embarrassed to some degree. These may or may not break the individual's commitment to continuing to practice willingly. The crawl stage is full of false progress as every new piece of information seems like the key to a current dilemma that only opens doors to more problems and dilemmas. And just like real keys, it's frustrating trying to cipher through a ring full of them to find the one you need. The common mistake is giving the wrestlers an overwhelming number of options of which he will remember just a few at any point. Then a coach will continuously remind the student that they failed to remember the material. Sometimes it and Apos, s directly confronting the individual I taught this last week, we went over this, did you forget the thing? Eventually, the young wrestler will get frustrated that they can't remember everything. 
This is important because in the crawling stage the wrestler isn't as committed as in later stages and is often discouraged by negative emotions a lot faster and easier than in later stages. This is where the compulsory support system has an advantage over other training methods. An authority figure encourages the individual through trials they might not choose otherwise. The harder a parent, coach, etc. push a wrestler past their desired output in the crawling stage the quicker they will develop but the shorter their desire to continue wrestling will be. That's not to say there aren't exceptions. Many of the top tier D1 wrestlers are exceptions to this idea but for every exception, there's probably 10 more that could have been just as great but lost interest in the sport and only pursued it for as long as they were an expectation to do so. Burning out in the sport of wrestling is a common occurrence at all levels because the sport can be demanding but I think it's common for burnout to set in as a wrestler learns to crawl. If they never develop a strong interest in the sport as a beginner, then the odds of them continuing to become more advanced become slimmer and slimmer. Not many people know this but the reasons why I joined wrestling is because their warm-up had handstands, cartwheels, walking on their hands, and rolls. I know I'm not the only one who picked up wrestling because it was fun not because they wanted to train to be top-tier wrestler. Should my young wrestler, maybe even younger than fifth grade, lift? That's a controversial topic. I've seen studies suggesting that lifting heavy weights at a young age stunt a person's growth. I've heard lifting helps improves young individual health and well-being later in life. Here are my thoughts on it. Wrestlers are short. If your biggest reason is to avoid lifting is because you want your son to grow up tall then you put him or her in the wrong sport. With that being said I am not endorsing lifting or not to lift. Here's what I've seen. Those who start lifting young will win more matches because they are developing strength many of their young opponents haven't started yet. There are pros and cons with this and I'd like to make the distinction between lifting weight and plyometric, bodyweight, exercises. Starting with lifting weights whether free weights or cables. Let's pretend your wrestler is lifting to a healthy level of intensity, whatever that may be. Your wrestler will get stronger. It will change their maturity development in the sense they will be able to recover quicker from soreness than a child who doesn't work out or lift. They are more than likely develop an affinity towards lifting as they grow older. However, their strength is a double-edged sword, because they are noticeable stronger at such a young age they don't have to develop as much as a wrestler to win matches. They can power through their opponents which will work less and less as they get older and their peers begin to catch up developmentally. For the success they had in youth they will start to struggle to maintain later in their wrestling careers. Also, the more a wrestler relies on lifting and power at the cornerstone of their success the more rigid and robotic they become. Muscle memory is an incredible and extra muscle can limit range of motion. When you only teach your body to only move for power it becomes quite difficult to adopt a more fluid style. That means their shot might look more like a squat, their snap down could look like a textbook triceps extension, and moving their feet resembles look like they could be moving around with a barbell on their shoulders. That's not good, that's not bad. Just an observation. There have been good wrestlers, especially heavier weights that thrive with that kind of style. Dieting and cutting weight are some of our sport and APOS, s biggest taboos. To start with I'd like to mention the difference between cutting weight, losing weight, and dieting. Dieting in my opinion is making an additional effort to eat healthier. That doesn't necessarily mean the person is losing weight and can mean the exact opposite in that a person's new diet is helping them gain weight. The key part of a diet is eating more balanced and healthier, that's it. I firmly believe everyone could diet a little bit better and then shouldn't be any cons to a healthy diet only benefits. Next is losing weight, which is any sustainable effort made to lose body fat. The key word in that sentence is sustainable. What that means is in theory the individual could live the next couple of years, in the same manner, every day with relatively few adjustments as they approach their target weight. Generally speaking, the sustainable part means long-term changes. However, a sudden and sharp drop can happen and should be expected especially after an involved workout but generally bounces back to comparable levels as before. This is normal and often misinterpreted. What a young wrestler, 
or anyone for that matter, weighs after a hard workout isn't necessarily their new natural body weight, and one nutrient-rich meal and a tall glass of water will have the numbers on the scale bouncing, like the stock market with highs and lows throughout the day or week. What's important as one loses weight is to notice the overall trend of their weight loss over time, not days or the week. Lastly, is cutting weight. In this book cutting weight will be or is defined as any efforts made to become lighter which cannot be sustained. If losing weight looks like a stock market chart when it dips, then cutting weight would look like the stock market during the Great Depression or more recently during the coronavirus lockdown. There are sudden and severe drops and gains in the individual's weight which often affect the body and person, but we'll get to that in a second. For now, just understand that cutting weight is not sustainable, most likely intentional, and the least enjoyable of the three. General advice a doctor will give is there isn't a good reason not to teach your young wrestler how to eat a good diet. Eating healthy has a load of health benefits and everyone knows they should eat clean but more often than not people don and apos, t eat healthy. The earlier you teach your wrestler the benefits of eating clean the more likely it is going to stick with them their entire lives but that is not to say there won't be plenty of obstacles to that. For starters, the household eating junk while the wrestler is told to eat clean. If expected to eat cleaner than everyone else for whatever reason now dieting becomes a punishment. It's a different story if the wrestler is given the knowledge and chooses to eat cleaner than their household. Strictly telling them no but keeping it around for everyone else to have is sending mixed signals which don't favor a healthy diet in the mind of a youth wrestler. Saying you can't have it because I said but everyone else can because reasons make most people want what they can't have. Second, our culture promotes unhealthy eating and there will be considered outside influences to discourage a healthy lifestyle. What is important to understand is at five years old your kid is still growing up, a greasy burger for most athletes won't make a difference in their college career. Instead of focusing on maintaining a spotless record focus on maintaining a continuous effort. I'm sure there will be foods your wrestler loves that is not good by any means. I'm sure they will want to eat it all the time. I'm almost positive if given the choice they'd skip whole meals just to enjoy their preferred treat. I'm sure many parents have experienced their wrestler eating clean as can be for an extended period then after a big tournament like states they grab a pizza or whatever deep fried snack they can from concessions. In this example after half an hour or so the wrestler has horrible gas, they feel bloated, and generally feel bad. The negative reinforcement of junk food playing havoc in the gut can be enough to keep some on the straight and narrow path. Perhaps not the first time, but eventually those twisted guts get old, just ask anyone with lactose intolerance. I've known a few lactose intolerant teenagers who would suck it up for ice cream or chocolate milk but I don't know many adults who'd push things as far. This is why consistency is stressed above all else. Now there are a lot of types of diets and I won't tell you the best one because there isn't a best one. But here are some tips that will save you a lot of time. Everyone's body is different and different diets work more efficiently for different body types. It does not matter what diet you try if you never started or fail to be consistently doing it. A diet should not be miserable, it should not take great amounts of strength or perseverance to maintain a diet. No one said dieting had to be a race as long as you keep to it the progress will come at the pace you set. When you first start it might be a little tedious or uncomfortable at certain hours of the day but never miserable or unrelenting. If it is unbearable, you or your wrestler took too big of a step in your diet plan for it to still be considered a diet in my book. Losing weight is a touchy subject because it's the precursor to cutting weight. Losing weight varies from person to person but again the main concern is, can the individual maintain this pace without breaks? Losing 5 pounds a week may seem like a lot to most people but if you have 5 pounds to lose every week, you're getting all your nutrients, and you don't feel drained and weak at all waking hours then there's no problem. However, skipping lunch and dinner to lose an extra couple pounds before bed quickly becomes cutting weight. Losing weight should not make you feel weak, overworked, or tired all the time. Losing weight may make you feel hungry after dark, or extra aware of an upcoming meal, but it shouldn't disrupt your life in any meaningful way. Losing weight means still meeting the body's needs. 
Here are a few tips for losing weight, no matter how well you diet, you will begin to plateau eventually if everything remains consistent between your workouts and diets. Something you can do to prolong your body from plateauing other than changing your workouts is eating more consistently, which doesn't necessarily mean more food just eating smaller portions more often or bigger. Eating less after a certain point has more harm than good no matter the goal. You are what you eat is a saying for a reason. If you burn more calories than you take in you will lose weight every time. While dieting and working out, weight fluctuations are to be expected. A sudden drop is most likely water weight and it will need to be replaced eventually. The closer you pay attention to your weight progress and diet, the easier it will be to predict future results, practice long enough and a wrestler can tell their weight down to the tenth of a pound just by feel and observations. A cheat day is not the same as two cheat days or three or a week. Anything zero calorie is a slippery slope, there's research saying it's good for you and research saying it's bad for you, but what is pretty standard is the reason for zero calorie snacks, if you try to satisfy your hunger with a diet coke, you're going to be hungrier later. Lastly, drinking more water is okay and makes the progress of losing weight easier. Cutting weight is probably the worst part of our sport. Cutting weight more often than not involves water weight and can include not eating. If you haven't noticed I specified in dieting and losing weight that drinking water is okay. Drinking water while cutting weight is counterproductive because that's exactly what most people trying to shed during this phase of training. Cutting out water plays a large part in what makes this form of weight loss unsustainable. It's possible to cut weight without water loss but it's not very common nor as unsafe. For those wondering about water, weight refers to the water, in the form of sweat or urine or, or spit, a wrestler, through focused efforts, loses in an attempt to manipulate their weight in a short period usually a week to a couple of days. But losing a lot of water weight or at least enough to make a difference in weight classes will always negatively affect the athlete and APOS's performance. It's just a question of to what degree. So why do people cut water weight? For starters sweating and losing water isn't bad in itself. Saunas are a great recovery tool when used properly. It's by far the fastest and easiest way to lose weight and quick to replace. A college heavyweight in a hot practice room can casually lose 14 pounds of sweat in a single practice. That's not exaggerating, I've seen it done. However, water weight is also the hardest to maintain and the most disruptive by far. As soon as the individual drinks anything or eats anything with any juices their body will soak up any liquid, and no matter what you need to drink liquids eventually. Additionally, science says the average person can go weeks without eating any food but only go a couple of days, less than a week, without any liquid. I mentioned this to give perspective on how disruptive losing 14 pounds of water in a couple of hours can be. How many days worth of water is 14 pounds to a heavyweight? It doesn't really matter I haven't heard of any heavyweights that can keep up that pace for more than two or three days at a time. To cement my point, I've also seen lighter weight wrestlers have to go to the hospital after losing 14 pounds in one night. So what benefits is there in losing this weight? Earlier I mentioned lifting was one way to become stronger than your opponent while another way is to wrestle weaker opponents. I'm sure that's how weight cutting started, a few individuals more dedicated than most losing enough water weight to make a weight class lighter and wrestle technically smaller opponents after they rehydrated back up to their original weight. And just like lifting, getting a sudden strength boost over your opponent makes producing favorable results easier. In the past decade what that has meant in tournaments is everyone cutting weight as to not be the little guy wrestling their true walk around weight. However. Kids started dying and changes have been made to discourage cutting weight and word through the grapevine is, the rules will change for the better as time progresses. I'm not trying to scare any new parents away from our sport altogether but cutting weight shouldn't be taken lightly. It is taking away things the body needs to survive so that the individual can meet a superficial goal. Also, a good point to note for new parents, the act of cutting weight is hard to detect and stop. However. What can't be hidden are the effects. Cutting weight without a doubt negatively affects performance until the individual can replace what they lost. 
This is important because the NCAA and every high school knows this and has begun to set up systems that make the benefits of cutting weight void. For example, after cutting weight a wrestler generally jumps off the scale at a tournament and rushes over to indulge themselves in a few sport drinks, snacks, and sandwiches to replace what they lost and to regain their stamina, strength, etc. However, any nutritionist will tell you it's going to take more than a couple of hours for all that food to make its way throughout the body. Fortunately, or unfortunately, weigh-ins at the most will be two hours before the first match and sometimes as little as one hour. Any wrestlers cutting weight are more than likely going to have to go a match with an empty gas tank. For the heavy guys who probably have a few hours before they wrestle no matter what way outs, make sure they have to maintain a reasonable weight the entire day which is considerably harder to do while performing. As mentioned earlier healthy diets can only have positive effects on an individual when marketed to them in a semi-decent way. However, Losing weight and cutting weight will have a wide range of effects on the young wrestler's life. Losing weight is supposed to be healthy so you may be wondering how it shares anything with cutting weight. Well losing weight may be safer, more practical, and in general just a better idea but that doesn't mean it will help socially. I'm sure you can google page after page of all the health benefits of a good diet and understand how heavier set kids can benefit from losing some weight. I'm sure there is plenty of articles both condemning and promoting children to lose weight but there will be very few articles about how eating beef and broccoli for lunch can affect their social life. Take a second and picture all the social gatherings you went to in the past couple of months. Do you have a few in mind? Now how many of them involved food, drinks, or snacks? It's kind of unsettling to think of how many things we do that involves food. Kids are no different. Almost everything they can afford to do or be a part of involves food. Your wrestler will have to decide to go to these social events, sit at their peers' lunch tables, meet with family, or something similar and not eat the food everyone else is enjoying. Or they'll have to decide not to go and avoid the temptation altogether. Again, that's not good nor bad. This in itself won't make your little man a social outcast. It's just something to consider when you look at how strict you want your wrestler to be with his diet and how that means more than simply giving up food. Again people, especially young people, are social beings and they naturally want to avoid anything that makes them stand apart from the crowd. So how does cutting weight affect a young wrestler? Just like before with lifting the more weight a younger wrestler forces off the more of an advantage they will have on the mat because they will be stronger as they naturally weigh more and have more muscle than their opponents. However, success based on strength hinders the growth of fundamentally sound techniques. If a wrestler learns to win by being bigger than their opponent eventually their opponents will be roughly the same size regardless of what your wrestler does, but they'll have experience with better technique as a cornerstone to their success. Furthermore, in the crawling stage, a young athlete develops a passion for the sport which he fosters over the years into becoming a better wrestler. If you start the sport at a pace that burns out most college wrestlers, then you drastically reduce the chances of the individual even making it to the high school arena, let alone college. Cutting weight also produces shorter wrestlers which can be taken as both common sense and scientifically proven in several ways. How much shorter? That depends on the individual, how young they started cutting weight, and how much they lost. The body can't grow without food and human history with famines has shown us that. Also similar to losing weight, cutting weight will play a more drastic role in their social life as now they are withholding nutrients their body needs to survive and contemplating going out where food will most likely play a significant role. This one simple change in a wrestler's lifestyle makes non-wrestling friends harder to maintain. I would like to mention that if your wrestler has a team or peers of like-minded individuals to support them this social obstacle can be bypassed as they'll have clique friends going through the thick of it together. This applies to losing weight as well. However, no matter what the circumstances cutting weight will never be fun or enjoyable. It takes the fun out of the sport and even the best of world-class wrestlers has to contemplate if any other year of weight cutting and training is worth the goal they're pursuing. I firmly believe everyone has a set number of days they can willingly cut weight. 
There are things one can do to extend or shorten that time but eventually, there will be a day for everyone where cutting weight isn't worth the goal no matter how grand or plausible. There are more common side effects I've seen to cutting weight, both good and bad, but I'll mention them in the next section, walking, when the average wrestler starts getting old enough to drink coffee. If your little wrestler went from playing video games all day to wrestling, running, lifting, dieting, and maybe even playing multiple sports you might be worried they are going to overtrain themselves. Generally, moms are the ones asking but no matter who asks it's a good question. Is it rather hard to accidentally overtrain but it's quite easy to under-recover? What I mean by that is overtraining isn't a sudden thing. It takes time, it's a slow build-up and the signs are all there. Overtraining feels more like the body is achy and it progressively gets worse. Soreness begins to linger, small injuries become more frequent, and everything starts to take longer to recover. As the body starts to take longer and longer to heal, the individual becomes more sluggish. I'm sure if this is a concern for you in your situation there are plenty of resources on the internet describing what too much training can do to the body so I won't get too into detail with what to look out for. What I feel is important to realize is overtraining is not a consistent level of activity. For example, if your wrestler's limit before they are doing too much is exactly one mile of running that doesn't mean all through the wrestling season their limit is set at one mile. A lot of parents understand that when you describe progress and building into more intense workouts as your body develops. You lift, you get stronger, you lift heavier is an easy way to picture or grasp. Progress usually isn't the problem. The issue is usually when a wrestler regresses and there are a lot of reasons for a wrestler to regress. Maybe their nutrition begins to not meet the requirements needed of the body to stay healthy and it begins to break down. Maybe an injury caused a reset. Or perhaps they get sick. Whatever the reason, regression isn't necessarily bad until the training doesn't reflect the changes in the body. The more intense the workout the more time should be allotted for recovery of that particular muscle. Why is this important you might be wondering? Any intense exercise creates micro tears in the muscles which is good because it allows the body to rebuild the muscle and fill in those gaps making the muscle stronger. The more intense the workout the more micro tears there will be and the more the body has to repair which again in this context is good. What is not good is creating more micro tears as the body is still trying to repair the first set of tears. In the world of finances, this would be the same as collecting more debt before paying off the debt you already have. Eventually, you'll go bankrupt if you do that and that's a great way to picture how overtraining takes time. That's not to say you have to tone back your training any and every time a kid feels a little sick or sluggish. Just understand that overtraining is steady progress the longer you force the body to perform at a level it can't maintain then the harsher the repercussions on the body they will be. Continuing the finances comparison, having a day or two of muscle repair debt is not the same as building a debt over an entire season and giving a day or two for recovery. Overtraining will break down the body but it won't end a season in itself. What will be the injuries that become increasingly more likely as the body tries to maintain that peak performance? Things like mild tendonitis can start to develop after a while which is just the precursor for more severe injuries, like large tears. What is much more common and sudden but ends in the same result is not allowing enough recovery between workouts which becomes under-recovery. It's easy with a long season and weekly competitions to try to milk every day for all its work. It's hard to exercise restraint when there is never an exact moment you can look to as the point of no return. I know one person is reading this that enjoys pushing their wrestlers to break their personal bests and enjoys the more intense side of wrestling. That is fine, keep on doing what you're doing if it's working. Just understand two things about recovery. Any single muscle group can only be expected to do so much before the muscle is overworked and also understand every muscle on the body is strong enough to hurt itself. By that I mean we've all heard a story of a soccer mom lifting a burning car to save their son. In theory, the average person has the potential to summon that same amount of strength but it's not without cost. In these instances, the soccer mom may need to be hospitalized for the considerable strain she put on her body. So how is this relevant to under-recovery? Simple, 
you can push anyone to the point their efforts will hurt their body. Once at that point the muscle needs a chance to recover. Forcing someone to give 110% is asking them to do the best they can without injury then that extra 10% is how far the body can push itself without care of the damages to follow. As explained earlier if you give it 100% of your effort then you're creating micro tears, lactic acid builds up in the muscle, and a few other things which all work together and prevents the muscle from operating at 100% until it fully recovers, let's just say after giving 100% the muscle is knocked back to 70% pending recovery. So, what under recovery is not understanding the condition of the muscle and expecting it to perform past its current ability. If you lift heavy, one rep max, or in other words 100% effort, on Monday then whatever you lifted isn't going to be a strong Tuesday. So, your one rep max is no longer possible without hurting the muscle to some degree. Now your one rep max can be done again, and with the proper motivation or preparation is can be done several days in a row but each time the risk of a sudden and severe injury increases. Continuing the muscle and amp, finances comparison, it would be the same as taking out large loans in quick succession. Forget trying to pay off the muscle repair debt, the achievement here would be not going into bankruptcy. For a sport like wrestling where the entire body is involved, it becomes complicated on how to avoid these things and still push the upper limits of progress. So, my advice is to listen to the athlete and foster an honest and open conversation about their state of being. If they say they are progressively getting worse then pinpoint what is causing that and work around it. You might not have to ease up on the intensity just change what the intense part is. If the problem is dieting then plan a way to fix what they are eating to remedy their problems. If they are sick, stress doing things that aid in recovery whenever possible. Whatever the reason be aware that the coach that says suck it up may promote mental toughness but that isn't always good. Here's why and quot, suck it up and quot, may not be the good advice to give in the moment. Every room has a kid with a million excuses. However, in those incidences where adjustments do need to be made then what are the chances this same wrestler or other, tougher wrestlers on the team show vulnerability and explain they need a break? It's a lot lower than if you didn't shame the first wrestler for showing weakness. Something I've had success with is making the alternative options harder in a different way. So, if your excuse maker is always complaining about their ankle, that is fine. Letting him know anytime he wants to take five to rest that ankle it's okay but every rest is going to be in a handstand position and for at least two minutes. What I've seen that logic does is give the wrestler a choice to push through what they already have to deal with or give up and be rewarded with something harder in a different way. Anytime I see that same excuse maker in a handstand position I know they are still progressing in some way but their ankle must be bothering them if they choose a handstand over something easier that's not the only way and it's not the best way. Just another option to have because no matter what your stance you will find exceptions. Perhaps your stud wrestler breaks a finger and you still want him to complete the practice then maybe saying suck it up isn't the best option in this situation because it'll take longer to heal. It's up to you to decide but when the lines are not clear cut having more options is better than having one answer. Chapter 5 Walking as your wrestler progresses and learns more and more, he will grow into a walking wrestler. If he started as a five-year-old beginner maybe they start to walk as soon as middle school or it could be as late as college. Wrestling is not like karate, well like some karate gyms. Being in the sport for X number of years does not automatically earn you a promotion to the next stage of development. No matter when the wrestler starts their career it will be a while before they can walk and even longer still till they are good at walking. They may jump leaps and bounds and suddenly stop. Or they might be stuck in a rut before something randomly clicks and they suddenly start competing at a higher level than before. If this was math class, you just learned the formula now you have to apply what you know to the homework. And just like math class, a kid may understand one part of the problem but not the rest. Sometimes you may even notice they perform better in circumstances that shouldn't matter like when auntie comes to watch or a different coach sits in their corner. What is important to note is after a wrestler begins to walk, they will continue to walk for the rest of their wrestling career. 
Just because the individual is walking doesn't mean they have nothing left to learn nor does it mean all walkers are at the same level of progress. Even after your wrestler wins an Olympic gold medal he will still be walking, granted at a higher level, the same way your average youth wrestler would. In a sport of nearly infinite possibilities figuring out what is possible will never end. A decade ago, it was considered taboo to voluntarily roll across your back. Today as long as you grab a foot before you do it it's called a leg pass and Jesse Delgado won two DI national titles almost exclusively with it. Progress in this stage is erratic to start with but it begins to even out as the wrestler progresses. Individuals begin to develop their personalized styles as they begin to fall into their patterns of wrestling. The reason why this stage starts as a mess trying to get better and slowly works itself into focused improvements is that not every combination of moves and techniques is a winning style for every individual. An extreme example can be Anthony Robles, a DI national champ from Arizona State. He only has one leg so I'm sure his coach isn't telling him to throw his opponents. Your wrestler is experimenting with his options at this point trying to figure out what works for him and exploring the things that he's had success. That fear of failure thing I mentioned plays a bigger part in this stage than in crawling. The more easily a move will work for them the more often they will rely on it. However, that doesn't automatically transition to long-term success. Headlocks work a lot more frequently in youth than they do in high school. Some kids will understand this and have to readjust their styles to continue having the same success. Some kids are more stubborn and look for ways to make it work. Neither option is inherently wrong. Whatever the case, this constant cycle of developing and changing tactics is why progress is rocky. It also explains why it begins to settle as they get older. There aren't many Olympians that have to reconsider their entire offensive series. They may change moves in the series in and out but they are sharpening an attack system not reintroducing a new one. However, numerous middle school kids are realizing there is more to a shot than simply driving your feet harder. Some add setups, some focus more on their timing and level changes, and some continue to just drive harder. I'm sure that eventually, your wrestler will find a winning technique that is by far their favorite move to hit. Eventually, they may even start to take pride in being infamous for how well they can hit said move. You could even say they become somewhat of an expert on this particular attack. The last 30 seconds of a match, down by one point, and everyone knows what is coming, sound familiar? My advice to you is still to find something better. Whether it's a replacement move or an additional link in the series of moves that includes their favorite move but just assume someday his favorite move won't work as he's hitting it now and he will have to have a different answer for when that day arrives. Even if it helps them remain undefeated it doesn't mean that will be the case forever. If the world is always improving and advancing the moment you stop to hold on to what you already know you're regressing as everyone else continues to move forward. Styles make matches is a common saying in most combat sports. What I've always considered the second half of the adage to be and quote semicolon and amp, body types make styles and quote. This is probably one of the simplest ideas I have to offer but one of the hardest to implement because it requires foresight and honesty. Styles make matches boil down to a similar concept to the basic concept of rock, paper, scissors. Certain styles naturally work well against others as they play off their weaknesses. In wrestling, there are considerably more than two or three wrestling styles, but in the interest of time and space, I am only going to mention two extremes I've seen. First are the tall, lean wrestlers who are especially efficient in their efforts, despite his lack of strength his funky wrestling style always allows him to attack his opponent's weakest points while he straddles to a line of good and bad positioning. The second is the short, muscular wrestler who holds immense strength or exceptional explosive potential, this kind of wrestler can be seen as the unstoppable force choosing to overpower their opponent through immense but direct efforts. I picked these two because they can't mimic the other's style to the same level of success as they can their own no matter how long they train to do so. That is not to say you can be better at the same moves in a different way. But the boxer with the stronger reach is going to win a battle of toe-to-toe -to -toe jabs if the only difference is their reach. The boxer with the shorter range has to compensate for that to win the jab battle. 
If they win it's because they had a jab that wasn't good enough, too short, but it came from a good enough angle to compensate for range, or because he was fast enough to get in range, or some other reason than just being good at throwing a fist forward because that's all the other guy has to do till you change the game. Similarly, the strong and muscular wrestler who can barely touch his shoulder can't be expected to effortlessly move around in a scramble on the mat like the lean wrestler does effortlessly. And the lean wrestler can't be expected to power through people to the same level of success with their blast double, aka a football tackle, when they don't have the same amount of power behind their shot. I'm not saying these two can't practice the other's moves and get good at them. In theory, that just means more tools in the toolbox which will make some job in the future easier. What I am saying is that they will never be as good at playing the same game as someone with the appropriate body type to do so. If you want to outfunk a funky guy a longer reach and flexible joints will help a lot more than how much you bench when you try to play your opponent's game. However, your bench may help hold a stiff arm that allows for a scramble your opponent wasn't ready for because they aren't strong enough to hit that move. As a wrestler learns to walk, they will be making moves and combinations from a wide range of sources. Whether you're sending them to 10 different wrestling camps with 10 different coaches or they only have the privilege to go to their team's wrestling practice it doesn't matter. They will still be learning from the matches they watch, exposure to other kids, online video clips, or even just playing around in a position. I mention this because no matter what information they are getting, it will be less beneficial if they don't recognize the difference in their body to the person showing the move. Of course, the heavyweight made that sprawling technique work. He has 300 pound behind it. The better question is does it work someone who's perhaps half the size? If it does work, does it work as well as the heavyweights? Why or why not? This sounds simple but the gray area comes when the kid has an obvious mixture of differently built parents. For example, when mom's short and lean and dad's tall and broad. Their child at 8 years old looks like he got more from his mom's genes but as he matures, he grows towards dad's figure getting stuck somewhere in between by the time he hits puberty. So, the parents originally focused on getting the young lad move sets that mimic a funky or agile, less powerful style but eventually, the kid is no longer able to move around as he used to and they have to switch to a power-based approach. Would it have been better to start him with a more power-based style at the start to give him more useful experience in the long term or was it appropriate to give him more tools that he can draw from as he develops his wrestling career? Is there a correct answer? Who knows? What doesn't change is if the kid is developing into a heavyweight, then his style needs to mimic what he's capable of not what he thinks is cool, flashy, what I've always done, because a gold medalist does it, etc. Ben Askrins, an infamously funky wrestler, wrestling camp may contain numerous fundamentally sound wrestling moves, but it means nothing if a part of the move is holding your opponent and Apos, S weight and the wrestler in question can't do that. Or the opposite scenario when a big man move involves keeping your opponent still long enough to gain a better position but your agile wrestler is going against other agile guys who can back out far enough to never allow it. I am not suggesting your heavyweight wrestler can't learn an ankle pick because it's a lightweight move. Kyle Snyder won Olympic gold at the 97 kilograms, 213 pounds, weight class and an ankle pick was one of his specialties. However, his ankle pick is considerably different than David Taylor's, 165 pounds 4x national champ. Taylor allows himself to go underneath his opponent while Snyder stays on the outside away from where his opponents can place their weight. Be aware of not only what moves your wrestler is learning but also what abilities are required to hit them to a high level of success on the next stage of their wrestling career. If your wrestler is built for speed and is naturally very fast and explosive find fast and explosive moves to emulate. If your son has unusually long arms, then look into what moves can take advantage of that fact like a cradle series. If he has great balance what are the possible implications for that? I think there are countless attributes, characteristics, and abilities that are underappreciated because everyone is focused on a few features. The better you and your wrestler understand their body the better you'll be able to equip them with tools that'll lead to their success. To cement my point no one talks about the importance of grip strength until they can't break someone's grip. 
If one can't break my wrestler's grip he might unconsciously take more or different shots than most. No one mentions balance until they can't knock someone off one foot. If no one can knock my wrestler off his feet maybe he becomes less focused on preventing shots in favor of something else like scrambling or offense. No one cares about flexibility until their opponent effortlessly bends out of a disadvantageous position. If my wrestler is double-jointed in his shoulders maybe, despite our best advice, he defends halves from bottom differently. Or how many times have you considered how long or wide a person's torso is? This one baffles me because, in my opinion, torso to leg ratio has one of the biggest impacts on what is feasible than any other body part, however, everyone is worried about how many muscles the guy has. Everyone notices how fast a quick shot is. And everyone appreciates how many moves a technical wrestler has at his disposal. Not that those are wrong by any means it is just there are so many more factors that combine to make a great wrestler. As your wrestler makes his way from a crawl to a walk, he will also be getting older, more mature, and perhaps even more willing to push their limits even farther. There will never be a single moment where you or your wrestler will know they are physically and mentally ready to step their training to the next level. Just like everything else in our sport, it will be a continuous progression where they will feel more and more certain. I mention this because no matter what pace they choose to make their progress there will always be people who seem to start their next phase of training sooner than your wrestler and there will always be those who seem they are progressing slower, at least by your wrestler's standards. As tempting as it may be to base your wrestler and APOS, s progress from the progress of others, don't. For those who know the tale of the tortoise and the hare they may remember slow and steady wins the race. If your goal as a parent, coach, or whoever is to get your wrestler to the collegiate level or to win high school states then it doesn't matter if they never won a state title in youth does it? These can be seen at benchmarks to assess where your wrestler is compared to those around him, but it's such a trivial measurement in so many ways. The reason I mention this now is that there will come a point in time where you as an authority figure in your wrestler and APOS, s training where you will see another wrestler making more progress than your own because of their willingness to do something your wrestler isn't currently doing. It may be cutting weight, it may be working out twice a day, it may even be competing in bigger, farther away tournaments. Whatever, the case I know it's tempting to say that's what they're doing so we have to do the same. That's also how you decrease the chances of your wrestler succeeding in the long run. Not so much the activities themselves. True, none of those are particularly fun but not what I'm talking about is forcing a young athlete to do something they don and apos, t want to do in the sport is how you burn them out or cause them to want to quit sooner. Not by exposing different things other wrestlers are doing that yours is not and apos, t currently doing. That's the key. Choice. I'm sure there's someone who want to argue that so let's put it this way. If this was a mile race and that wrestler, you and Apos, re-comparing your son to comes out of the gate sprinting, you wouldn't tell your wrestler to keep up. You would tell your wrestler to keep at their own pace. Eventually, one of two things will happen, that person will get tired and stop or slow down or he'll keep a pace that your son couldn't match at this point. Either way, your wrestler's best chance of hitting his personal best is to keep at his own pace. As an outsider looking in you see the results but not the struggle, never assume your wrestler is worse off for not doing something someone else is doing or getting the immediate results you want for your wrestler. For those who are unsure of the wisdom in these statements here is an exercise anyone can do at any time. Google your state's youth state champs, preferably from 5 plus years ago. If the logic were true that being the best early means constantly being the best as the years progress, then the top three state places in youth should still be at the running for the top spots in high school by their senior year, right? In my experience, I've noticed two things, a good portion of the top contenders in youth never make it past freshman year, and by high school, many of the top contenders are ones that remained consistent not necessarily the best. Eventually, there will be a time you and or or your wrestler are ready to make those next steps. It may not be healthy, but it is normal for a wrestler at some point to want to cut weight. It's normally a certain point to want to travel to the bigger tournaments and to put in extra work. 
If and when it is time for your wrestler to do more for the sport, then by all means let them if it's possible for your situation. I'm not advising you T. If and when it is time for your wrestler to do more for the sport, then by all means let them if it's possible for your situation. I'm not advising you to hold your wrestler back from anything they want to do but understand this isn't a one-way street. A common mistake I've seen as a college coach is kids understanding that with each year that goes by they have to cut more and more weight or do more work. What ends up happening is by their senior year of high school they cut more weight than can positively benefit them and they do worse their senior year than their junior year. Or they end up getting hurt with extra training. Or something else happens and they just aren't able to compete to the level they want. It's a mistake I've made, it's a mistake I've seen people on the world level make, and it's a mistake I've seen at every level underneath it. More doesn't mean better. There are other things a wrestler can do to improve themselves beside cut more weight, train more hours, or compete in more tournaments. A good rule of thumb is quality over quantity any day of the week. If given the choice, most people will go to a practice held by Bobby Douglas, former USA Olympic coach, before one held by a two-time high school state champ. And it doesn't have to be training it can be recovery based or it could be mental training. Every wrestler has had nerves at some point. This is called the walking stage because they are walking. There aren't many people who compare their walk to others from day to day. Every step is consistent progress towards a goal. There will be a time where sudden ramp up asks for a wrestler to go from walking to running and we'll cover that in the next chapter but the point of this chapter is to understand whether it's dieting, cutting weight, lifting training, conditioning, practicing, stretching, competing, recovering, or whatever else you can imagine, consistent efforts will always be more productive in the long run than extreme efforts which can't be maintained. One of my favorite tips for parents comes from Spencer Lee's dad, Larry. Spencer Lee is a wrestler whom I've heard in the conversation for the best pound for pound wrestlers in Division 1 and his father says remember it is their sport and not yours. Make sure they are working hard and make sure it is fun. Chapter 6 Running The image I want to present to you in this running stage is an individual running a 400 meter race or something similar, a pace that is fast, hard to maintain for the period of the race but also impossible to continue much farther after the finish line. For a wrestler to transition from the walking stage to running, a few things have to happen first. For starters, the wrestler has to be confident in their ability to walk. No one sprints before they can walk. No one can sprint forever. And sprinting isn't a natural mode of transportation it takes conscious effort unlike walking where one could walk a mile before realizing it. All of these ideas apply to running wrestling. After a wrestler figures out their style, after they developed a set of patterns and reactions, they will begin to explore the possibilities of what is possible with what they already know. Earlier, I explained this is normal and a sign of an efficient walker. However, this is usually in the practice room, at a slow pace, with time to think and process what is possible or reflect what would have been better. In a live competition, time is a luxury one often can't afford. However, eventually, your wrestler will develop the ability to do the same thing in real time. At first, it will begin with a single position or move and it'll slowly progress to more and more positions. The better they get at it the farther away they can get from positions they've drilled and mastered and into novel or awkward situations. In a sport of nearly infinite possibilities, your wrestler will begin to see that only a limited number of options can be led down paths with favorable results and they will have the ability to piece together options that eventually led to what they know will work in their favor. I loosely use the word no because his opponent will be doing their best to counter his efforts with their own and mapping how to get into positions that benefit him. Often this leads to sudden furies and scrambles where overall skill determines the outcome. I often suggest that that the better someone gets at scrambling the less often they scramble. In my opinion, all scrambling is how can one take a lesser known avenue of attack to reach time tested position of advantage. In the running stage, the position becomes more important than moves. In the earlier stages, moves were the focus. You learn what you can do as you crawl. You learn when you can hit these moves as you walk. 
and now you'll learn from where can you set up your moves to hit. Of course, every wrestler learns setups and develops a somewhat primitive instinct to detect when to hit their offense. Where the running stage is different is it becomes a sudden instinctive understanding of how the current position can progress into another more favorable position. The simplest I can explain, it's setting up a setup. That's not to say it is limited to one or two levels of setups. If you watch some of the highest tier wrestlers scramble, you'll notice that despite straddling the line of bad positioning all their efforts seem to not only progress them out of danger but that it seems that they're progressing towards some kind of offensive counter. It's not that a running wrestler has the foresight to plan a whole match in their heads. Rather at any given moment they understand what they need and don't want to give. I'd like to say that during this stage the wrestler also becomes aware of their opponent, how they're positioned, how they can move, what they want, what they don't want to give, etc. However, there will be some that begin to develop this sense as they are in the walking stage but will complete their development while running. As I'm sure you can imagine this level of understanding is complex and very involved but what might not be obvious is how this compares to running. Well, no one can run forever and no wrestler can correctly assess every situation in real time. Your wrestler could begin overcomplicating fundamental moves or they hadn't considered something their opponent did. For whatever reason, your son will give up points during a match and each time is a failed assessment of the position. To my understanding, there hasn't been a wrestler who's prevented all opponents from scoring a single point offensively. Without a doubt, some wrestlers are better at running than others but no one is perfect. Furthermore, Every wrestler is especially adept at what they are already familiar with. If your wrestler is an upper body thrower only kind of guy then, they will be better at most to position themselves for a throw from any position on the mat or their feet. This should be considered because your wrestler may be good on his feet, or even one of the best, but on the mat, if he's lacking it'll show against the right opponent. Like I mentioned before style still makes matches. Throughout the entirety of a match, this running wrestler will rely on combinations and move sets they've honed and practiced. Perfect technique will always beat perfect technique. This means that your perfect defense will be stopped by the perfect defense or vice versa and it goes back and forth till someone makes a mistake. It is not the goal to throw away your perfectly timed setup but rarely will one get the chance to perfectly set things up. To be considered a running wrestler involves bridging the gap between what your wrestlers know and where they are currently. If your wrestler has a good single leg, how do they shoot it when their opponent has your wrestler's foot in the air? I'm sure most people don't drill that but a running wrestler may have an answer to do so in that exact situation that they more or less made up on the fly. This may sound exceptionally hard but remember it comes with practice. There are many ways to practice such a skill. One possible method involves focuses on analyzing. Something that might have come in an earlier stage but most definitely will be a thing by the time they start running is the option of coaching slash teaching slash training others. Sometimes it's a college wrestler doing club work for a small team. Sometimes it's a high school volunteer coach. It can even be as simple as an extra practice with a teammate covering moves. One of the easiest ways for the top-tier wrestlers to get better is to try to teach what they already know to someone who knows nothing, a little bit, and someone of equal knowledge. A coach's biggest advantage over his players is he took the time to study his positions and not only through his eyes, but the eyes of those he coaches as they try to learn his material. Almost without exception every coach feels like they would have done considerably better as an athlete after a few years of coaching they begin to develop a different level of understanding of the sport. Why wait till they are done with competition to give them this experience? By the time a wrestler begins to run they should be in a position to help younger or less experienced wrestlers if they want. I encourage whoever to do it, there are plenty of studies in the field of education that teaching as a study tool is a highly effective study method for obscure ideas. Fortunately, Wrestling isn't very obscure which just makes the learning that much more permanent. There will be a barrier of self-doubt they have in the beginning but they need to understand they are practicing their skills by teaching and deal with the embarrassment. They will most certainly get questions they hadn't considered. The only obstacle of progress doing this will be their own ego and how hard they have to consider their own technique. Also, 
A friendly reminder, the longer a wrestler remains humble and open to learn the more opportunities to improve, they will have to get better. There isn't a direct connection between how harsh a diet slash cutting weight should be and the running stage. In most ways, I'll give the same advice as to the walking stage. However, more often than not the running stage approaches the end of a wrestler's career. A young wrestler can start to walk as soon as middle school so a strict weight cut probably won't let them last another 12 years or so to make it past college and to the Olympics. In my experience, the most exceptional wrestlers start running towards the end of their high school career but most begin in college as freshmen or sophomores. As far as the NCAA is concerned that means they might have four or five years left at most to compete. So, with the end relatively close, you'll see many wrestlers grit their teeth and push themselves farther past what is considered safe than ever before. The running stage is full of intentional burnouts but these same individuals more or less volunteer for it, as oxymoronic as that sounds. I would say an overwhelming majority of seniors in college approach practice like it's a job they take pride in but a job no less. What is underappreciated in this stage is stretching. Guys particularly, begin to shy away from stretching as it comes with a less manly stigma and the older they get the manlier they have to be. I've heard a load of excuses as to why wrestlers don't stretch. Here are some of the most leading slash frustrating, people who stretch lose their explosiveness. I don't wrestle as well when I stretch, or I don't feel like I need to stretch. Here are the facts, stretching does, in fact, reduce the explosive potential of the muscle, multiple studies suggest that but only for an hour or two at the most, and more than likely we're talking about minutes with a slight change in explosiveness. Stretch after your workout and it won't matter either way. The wrestlers who say they don't feel like they need to are also the ones that complain that their legs feel heavy, dead sluggish, off, tight, etc. They usually blame it on a weight cut which may be the case to an extent, but the other half of that equation is tight hip flexors, which is a different stretch than touching your toes FYI. I wrestle better when I'm tight guys are often the ones that have several injuries. And if they don't currently have injuries, they are the most likely to get some because their muscles don't allow a full range of motion which is never good in any situation but especially in a sport where your opponent will test your full range of motion. Besides risking injury while competing you risk a lifetime of problems which by the time the wrestler feels there's a problem it's too little too late. I know someone will read this and say they figure it out when they get there but I'm here to tell you it's like putting off losing weight for a tournament. When you do start, it is going to suck and the entire time you'll wish you started earlier when it wouldn't have sucked as much. Mark my words the back problems will come and they are unrelenting. As a parent, coach, or mentor your job will never be completely done. You will always be needed to some degree to support your wrestler. However, as they start to run if you completely withdrew all your support, they would still be able to continue to improve or maintain unaided. At this point, they should understand what they need to achieve what they want and more often than not have the work ethic to maintain it. Running wrestlers on average are more committed than any other stage. Often, they have a big goal in mind and often this goal determines how committed they are to the sport. It is not uncommon for a wrestler to give it their all at any stage but out of all of them, the running stage is most likely to have an abrupt stop. In the other stages, it may be a slow decline that everyone can seem coming. However, in the running stage, many individuals will give 110% for a particular goal, and as this goal passes take the shoes off to never compete again. However, out of all the stages they are the most likely to stay around the sport in some capacity. I choose to coach, some individuals are content with watching the sport, some put their kids into the sport. However, they scratch that it is up to them, but once they reach the running stage, they are a wrestler for life. Chapter 7 Rest After your wrestler is done competing completely, not between seasons but done, they will begin to fully appreciate the consequences of their training for better or for worse. The positives that come from wrestling a long career comes with the habits and knowledge you incur. After a few years of trying different foods, workouts, and rituals you'll have a lot of experiences of what does and does not work. Maybe you'll make the transition from player to coach to parent. Whatever the case here are some of the best things that come from wrestling. 
The first is wrestling builds a set of athletic abilities unique to our sport. We have a special blend of balance, conditioning, power, speed, flexibility to name a few. All of which help navigate the real world. Being in better shape is a great way to make work and life more pleasant. There are studies that show being in shape can improve mood. One of my favorite things wrestling teaches is personal responsibility. Early we touched on excuses other sports can make but wrestler can't. As a wrestler you are by yourself with only your own ability. This can be scary. Often many newcomers are unsure of themselves or if this is something they can do. They want to make excuses and that is normal. However, the longer they wrestle the more they will begin to own up to their success. Wrestling teaches something that is rare to find. It teaches the individual how to be personally accountable amongst other things. Without a doubt, a wrestler has a stereotype for mental toughness. And to a degree that is true. Wrestling is harder than most sports simply for the fact that there are weight classes. However, it's not that wrestling makes the individual something they are not. It just helps them prioritize what they want. As an individual sport you can see progress directly correlate to the work you do. So, wrestlers learn earlier than most that the best things in life aren't free. When you are able to take personal responsibility for your training, for your actions, for your commitment it is easier to push through short-term goals to accomplish long-term ones. Nutrition and weight management are a big one. After a full wrestling career from youth to college I'm sure your wrestler will have had tried every diet there is. Experiments with multivitamins, and different kinds of protein powders. By the end of a long career a veteran wrestler will have comparable knowledge as a basic nutritionist. They may not be able to explain many of the science behind what they know or even know what they are doing but they'll be able to assess their body and its functions like a nutritionist and eat accordingly. For example, a potato has more potassium than a banana. If you're cramping, eat half a potato not a banana if you can afford the starch. Tips like these that you learn through the course of a career make wrestler great candidates for gym owners, coaches, personal trainer, and nutritionist. Wrestling forces the individual to understand these high-value areas of health in a way other sport cannot. Misery loves company so as your wrestler trains and is tired and out of breath they will have teammates with them. The main reason parents put their kids in sports are social reasons and wrestling is no exception. It may be an individual sport but there is a die-hard community out there. The longer you are in the sport the farther away you'll start to travel and you'll be amazed at how many of the faces you see stay the same. The same coaches, the same kids, the same parents over the course of years. To be a good wrestler you need to be disciplined just like any other sport. And just like any other sport wrestling will teach you discipline as you continue it. I would argue that wrestling teaches more discipline than most sports. It takes a lot to train but it takes even more to train and that especially as a kid. Wrestling is a great way to get an education. There are scholarships and grants for wrestlers, wrestling families, wrestling team, you name it. What's nice is basketball and football have insane enrollment numbers but wrestling is smaller. So, you have just as many Big Ten 100 programs with wrestling as football but considerably less athletes competing for the same spot. I am not saying it will be easy but statistically speaking your chances are better with wrestling. There are chances to travel overseas and get an education as well as compete. You can make a career doing just that. Wrestling is a vital skill used in most martial arts, mixed grappling, and even football including MMA. BJJ and judo complement wrestling very nicely. Some of the best football players have been wrestlers and you can even Google videos of top-tier NFL quality football player warming up with their wrestling dills. Wrestling is a strong and safe base to build from for older interests. It's even possible to make a career out of the sport as a professional athlete or a trainer of some kind. That are a few things that make wrestling the greatest sport there is. However, the brighter the light the darker the shadow and for wrestling the biggest shadow involves cutting weight. Some science suggests that very occasional weight cut could have some benefits but what I am talking about does not come close to fitting the category. I'm talking about the extreme weight cutters. 
the are you physically going to be okay? kind of weight cutters. These individuals probably won't notice the effects of cutting weight that they will when they're done competing. I've met a few wrestlers who, if they went to the doctor, would probably be diagnosed with an eating disorder of some kind. One young man explained to me he could accidentally forget to eat for two days and wonder why he felt like crap until it dawned on him, he was hungry. For these wrestlers, the eating disorder is concerning but not forever. Since their problem comes from an outside force influencing their lifestyle which doesn't exist anymore, they'll eventually return to a normal diet. However, what I've also noticed is these individuals are likely to swing to the other end of the spectrum as they can't stop eating. My group of friends have a running morbid joke that the most dedicated and extreme wrestlers after they're done competing follow one of two paths, either they stay super fit, eat clean, and live a healthy life suitable for a health magazine because that's all they know or they balloon up, never stop snacking, and never consider returning to wrestling shape or any kind of fitness shape. I can tell you that the harsher the weight cut the wrestlers do and the younger they are made to make these drastic cuts and the less knowledge they are given to adjust from these bad habits the more likely they are to fall into the second category. Another problem I've seen is addiction. In extreme weight cutting, some wrestlers choose to use substances to make the cut less intense. What is interesting about this topic is that in many of these cases any time the individual needs food instead of feeling hungry their body will crave their chosen substance instead and they won't know or feel they're hungry. After developing the habit of not eating these individuals struggle to control their addiction completely unaware another solution to their problems is simply eating. It isn't till after a light bulb moment that they make the connection then it's slow but steady progress towards recovery. Now you may be wondering what kind of addictions are we talking about? The more concerning ones I've seen are Adderall, it was his subscription, energy drinks, coffee, pre-workout, and chewing tobacco. The more obscure ones I've seen are Mio drink flavoring, gum, sunflower seeds, and ice cubes.